Hello, my name's Stephen Stacey. Welcome to the co-creation of myself, Marriage Enrichment Program. This is Lecture 1, The Five Textures of God's Love. What does this program cover? I will be showing you a model of how your inner world works. When you understand yourself better, I believe you will be better able to manage yourself for improved relationship outcomes. We'll be covering strengths and weaknesses, attitudes, core values, your sense of emotional well-being and your sense of personal ownership. One of the core goals of this course is to give your couple a common language so you can learn to talk about some relationship issues using the same framework and the same vocabulary. I hope you find this a powerful tool to enhance your relationship. One of the key premises of personal development is that if one partner grows in a marriage, then the other partner is often drawn to respond by raising their standard too. We find this in all other areas of life. For example, a teacher, if they develop their disciplining skills or their classroom management skills, will often find that their children respond in a more positive way to the growth that has happened inside the teacher. When we look inside all human beings, we find that everybody has two parts of themselves. They have the healthy part of themselves, which allow them to achieve some of their goals in life, or all of their goals. We all, however, have a broken part of ourselves. We'll look more at this broken part later. Within the healthy part of ourselves, we have some effective skills and some weaker skills. Some of us, when we enter into marriage, we're good at cooking. Some of us are not so good, but we develop them over the years. Some of us are good at communicating, at negotiating, at listening, at compromising, and others find that harder to do. Some of us are very good at parenting, and some of us are still struggling with certain key elements of parenting. When we enter into marriage, we all have some effective skills and all have some weaker skills. Part one of this course looks at how partners can raise some of their core relational skills to a higher level of effectiveness, thereby allowing them to achieve a higher quality of marriage. We all have a healthy part of ourselves. What does this mean? In practice, it means there's no blocks to growth. When we choose to raise our game in some area, we can do so. If I choose to spend 30 days improving my cooking skills, my listening skills, at the end of those 30 days, I am better able to do these things. Marriage is set up to be a lifelong path of growth. To make marriage work, we all need to become more effective at different skills. Ideally, we spend time developing our skills every year. The question becomes though, what are we growing towards? What are we striving to do? If we don't have a clear picture, then we might not invest in the right areas. The religious case has always been made that our aim in life is to become a temple of God. This might mean that we become good at becoming children to our parents, good friends, good at our couple relationships, and effective parents. And the more we do this, the more we will tend to embody God's love and God's spirit. Some call this process becoming a child of God. In other words, looking like God, becoming a disciple to Christ. The challenge is, do we have a reasonably clear picture of what God's character looks like. If we don't know what God, how God acts in the world, it's very hard for us to know where we ourselves should be heading.
The model we're going to use to help you understand your own inner world was developed by Eric Byrne, a positive psychologist. He felt there were five primary textures of love, five ways of being. One can expand this to think about God in this way. Some see God as a nurturing parent. He's trying to always encourage us to grow and to develop, to become more than we are at the moment. Some of us see God as a protective parent. God's word says do's and don'ts. He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves by breaking the rules that we have to live under. Some see God as a sensible scientist making the mathematical laws that build the universe or putting certain principles into human beings that allow us to be effective. Some see God as a relational team player. He wants to work with us and, and be with us and, and work with us as a, as, a, as a human family. And some see God as a creator, a creative force, making beautiful flowers and mountains and tastes and smells. And when we put this all together, we get a picture of a God who has many qualities. This model basically states that God uses five types of love in order to build this amazing universe and his relationship with his children. We can take that understanding and apply it to a human system. We can ask, are those different types of love present in this human system? What is the, how much of each type of love is present in the system? And what we find is very interesting. We find that all human systems, including marriage, need these five types of love to stay healthy. So we can use this model to understand something about my own personal development. After I was born, my parents obviously had expectations for me. They had hopes and dreams. What were some of those dreams? Well, one of the first ones is that I would act like a responsible and caring family member. They hoped, obviously, that I would develop the skills to play nicely with my brothers and sisters, um, to solve conflicts nicely, to be fair, to share. Um, and, of course, they, would, uh, they were hopeful that I would learn to sit nicely at the dinner table, follow the rules when we went out shopping. Um, and they hoped that I would start to act like a civilized human being. They would hope to hopefully find God that part of God developing within me, God's love. But they just didn't want a following child, a team player child. They hoped also that I would also develop my own personal creativity, my own gifts. And, and as I did so, many parents are proud of their children. Maybe they came, became, uh, you became good at football or developed your artistry skills or your musical skills. And your parents hopefully were proud of you, that you were creative in your own life, in your own way. They also hope that when you had your unique needs, um, to, you expressed them in a respectful way. You didn't shout and scream and say, I want it, I want it, I want it. Um, and that you would hopefully you know, ask and they hopefully would respond appropriately. And so we have these two aspects of ourselves that we hopefully were developing so that when we enter marriage, we have these skills already present in our life. Beyond these two skills, we obviously hope for something more. They hope that I would grow to be a sensible young child. I would um, learn to put my coat on if it was cold outside, and I would do so without being asked to. Um, if it was raining, they hoped I would learn to put my Wellington boots on, or um, if I was had um, to get up for school, they hoped, of course, that I got up by myself, had my breakfast, and caught the bus at the right time. Um, they hoped that I could learn to manage my life within within the context I was growing up in. 
that they wouldn't have to just do everything for me. Uh, maybe you made learn to make plans for your future. Maybe you you um, planned a holiday with your friends. Maybe you planned an event, um, and you learned how to uh, bring in uh, to, to get the resources needed to achieve those goals. So as they did so, as you did so, your parents could become proud of you, and conflict was um, reduced to a minimum. So these three skills are wonderful, but they're not enough. Ideally, we would have also had the opportunity to develop our nurturing parent. Ideally, we would have had the chance to, to, to because of our presence, to help other people become more than they are right now. Maybe we could have listened to our friends' dreams. Maybe we could have, um, some of us took on coaching roles to help other people develop. Um, some of us become good at praising and encouraging. Um, hopefully we all develop some aspects of our nurturing parent. And hopefully we also had opportunity to develop our protective parent. We had to learn to say no to certain things. Maybe we were aware that certain values were important and protective and we, we, we learned to follow those values um, to protect ourselves and other people. Hopefully we learned to solve conflicts that had gotten out of control um, and to lessen that tension and to, to, to find a resolution to them. Whatever it may be, we bring all these skills, all these five skills that we learned into our marriage and some of them are more developed than others. So when we enter into marriage, some of our abilities to express God's love are strong and some are weak and some are completely missing. Each partner has different strengths and different weaknesses. This leads to different personality types as well. Also, the culture we grew up in has a profound effect on our strengths and weaknesses. For example, Oriental culture is by nature, typically more of a team player culture. The Japanese are very team player orientated. The Americans tend to be more free child orientated. So you, when you marry someone across cultures, you might find when they, they bring their culture with them. It might be a shock to you because you're hoping for a team player partner and they're more of a free child. So when partners get married, they might find that they have quite different strengths. They bring different strengths to the relationship. In a marriage like this, as you can see, in such a marriage, a core part of the marriage will probably involve the husband encouraging his wife to become more nurturing, playful and practical. And the wife will probably spend time trying to encourage her husband to become more of a team player and more protective. This is very natural. They both want to see more of God's love expressed in their partner. They want, they desire to, to have God in their home. This raises all kinds of questions. You see, sometimes couples have, are both weak, say, in being protective. But the system will demand that they learn to be protective because if they don't learn that skill, they will use skills which aren't so healthy in order to protect their relationship. And we'll talk about that another time. So we can look at some examples of what it means to be a relational team player within marriage, for example. So we're thinking about the couple as a team how you treat each other with politeness and respect. Can you fulfill the promises you make to, the, to your partner? Can you fulfill their requests, if they're reasonable requests, if you're not overloaded with other, other things? Being loyal to your partner in your words, in your actions, is a big one, of course. Trying to be fair about how all the tasks that, that are needed to run a house and a home are fairly distributed. 
then again, there's, am I working to support the team in its goal to build a good family? And can I admire the goodness in my partner? Can I exude that feeling that I admire you as a human being? When it comes to develop my free child within my marriage, I need to be free, to be honest. Honesty is incredibly important, of course, in all marriages. I need to feel free in my heart to say sorry if I know I've done something wrong. Ideally, I can express my needs respectfully. Can I f am I free to trust my partner? Do I have things in my past that form a barrier? Have I developed my desire to be playful and joyful? Have I developed an urge to be creative in my marriage when it comes to cooking or designing the home or, or finding nice activities to do? And do I wish to be affectionate and romantic? Do I wish to develop those skills? When it comes to God's sensible adult love in marriage, there are all kinds of ways to express this. Of course, it's really important to have regular connection, to stay up to date with each other, to know, let each other know what you're doing and what your plans are and what happened yesterday. You also might plan your week together, therefore minimizing any possible stress. You ideally couples seek some agreement on how you use your finances or how you're raising your children or, or what roles around the home you each should do to, to make the family work. Or your religious life, how you express that. Ideally both express ideas, contribute to the um, planning. You need to plan holidays maybe or how your relatives are connected with you or how your friends interact with you or what kind of community activities. You might need to find a method that ensures that reasonably expressed needs, reasonable expressed needs are fulfilled. A lot of people find they might express needs but they don't get fulfilled by their partner. Moving on, we can ask, what does it mean to be a nurturing parent in your marriage? How can you exude faith in your partner, a belief in your partner? How can you offer encouragement to them, praise when they get something right? How can you listen to their dreams to help them clarify their dreams? How can you support their dreams? You can support them morally or you can practically support them by buying them books or helping them find courses or a job that they dream of finding. You can also, of course, study together and learn together. All these things are more a part of being a good partner in marriage. Lastly, you have to ask, how am I protecting myself and my marriage and my children and my, and my relationship of course you need to seek to compromise to find a midway position, usually. You have to find a method that works when it solves, comes to solving conflicts, respectfully. You can ask for change respectfully. If you don't like something, can you do that in a way that the partner can listen to you? Sometimes you just need to listen to the worries of your partner. They're stressed out and they're not functioning very well. And just listening to them uh, protects the relationship. You sometimes need to take on more, of course, when, you, when your partner's overworked or stressed. Sometimes we all have to do that. A partner's ill and we take on more responsibility to protect the relationship. We also learn to lead, need to learn to say, no, I don't want to do that, when we really feel that it's wrong for the family or ourselves or the relationship. 